So I will be talking about, I mean, EFX existence for three agents. So let's go to a typical setup of discrete fair division. So we are given a set of N agents and we have a set of M indivisible goods and each agent has a valuation function. So this valuation function signifies the utility the agent has for each subset of goods. And throughout the talk, we'll be de dealing with a specific kind of valuation functions, which are additive valuations. So the valuation of a particular set is the sum of valuations of the individual items in the set. And these are also happen to be the most relatively class of valuations. Okay, so in a typical setup, we have agents, we have goods, and each agent has a valuation function. And what do we aim for? So our aim is to find a partition of the good set. So let's say into N bundles, X1 up to Xn. So think of each Xi being allocated to agent I. And I want this partition to be fair. So whatever fair means. And depending on different notions of fairness, I mean, there are several spectrum of problems that you can see in fair division. And I would be talking about, I mean, on, I mean, I mean, envy freeness and its variance in this talk. So the quintessential notion of fairness is that of envy freeness. So for this, let me define what is envy. So given a partition, let's say x1 up to xn, I say that an agent i envies agent j if i strictly prefers j's bundle to his own. So naturally, an allocation is envy free if for all pairs of agent I have that I mean, all pairs of agents i and j, I have that i prefers, I mean, does not strictly prefer j's bundle to his own. So I have vi of xi to be greater than or equals to vi of xj. Important thing to note is both on the left as well as the right hand side of the inequality, I have the same valuation function. So i doesn't care how happy j is. I mean, it doesn't depend on vj of xj. So i doesn't care about how happy j is. All i care, the envy is there just because i feels that he would have been better off if he has j's bundle. Good. So as soon as you define a fairness notion, the first question that we typically ask is that, no, is it always possible to be fair? No matter how many agents, what kind of valuation functions they have, can we always be fair? So in this case, I guess the answer is easy that we see that it's not. I mean, just consider a simple example, two agents having positive valuation towards a single good. Since the good is indivisible, it has to be allocated to exactly one agent and the agent who has no good will end up envying it. So therefore we study relaxations so there are several relaxations here itself. I'm not going to mention all of them. So I will just focus on the weakest relaxation, rather, which is the strongest, I mean, analog of envy freeness in the case of indivisible goods. It's called envy freeness up to any good. So here, I say that an allocation is fair if, again, if I look at every pair of agents, I and J, it's okay if I strictly prefers J's bundle to his own. So it's okay if VI of XI is strictly less than VI of XJ. But as soon as I remove any good from J's bundle, this envy should disappear. So the quantifier here is actually important. So no matter which good I remove from J's bundle, following the removal of this single good, the envy should disappear. So in particular, I mean, for additive valuations, you can also look at it as removing the least valuable good from J's bundle according to I. Let me give you an example so that this becomes kind of clear. So consider the simple setting, two agents, three goods, the valuation matrix is, as you can see. And consider the following allocation, where agent one gets good one and agent two gets good two and three. So this is an EFX allocation I coined. Why? So well, first observe that agent two does not envy agent one because V2 of G2, G3 is 12. And V2 of G1, which is A1's bundle is 10. So, I mean, two does not envy one. One indeed envies two, but look carefully. So one has G1 and I have V1 of G1 to be strictly larger than V1 of G2. I mean, 10 is larger than nine. Similarly, I have V1 of G1 to be strictly larger than V1 of G3. In particular, I have V1 of G1 to be strictly larger than V1 of X2 minus G for all G in X2. So no matter which good I remove from two's bundle, following the removal of one good, then we would disappear. This is an EFX allocation. Similarly, consider this example now. So this is not an EFX allocation. Why? Because if you look at agent two, who has a valuation of nine, if you remove the good G3 from one's bundle, one is left with G1 and two prefers G1 over G2. So even after I remove G3 from one's bundle, two still envies agent one. As a result of which, I mean, this will not be an EFX allocation. So I hope the definition is pretty clear. And now we ask the same question. So under this notion of fairness, is it always possible to be fair? And the answer is that we don't know yet. And I guess, I mean, many people have also considered this as currently one of the most important problems in uh, discrete fair division. 
And so in this slide, I would just like to tell you kind of the state of the art, which is known so far. I mean, the most general case where agents have non-identical additive valuations, only we know that it exists when there are two agents. And it's a simple cut and choose protocol. Starting from three and more, this question is still open. I will and, and there has been some effort by lots of research groups to actually address this question by studying relaxations of this. It will not be possible for me to cover all the relaxations as a part of this talk, but I would just mention a few of them. So one of them is like approximate EFA. So I mean, following the removal of a good, I don't need, I don't, I don't, I don't need my valuation on my good set to be larger than the valuation on the other agent's good set. Let's say some fraction of it, half, two thirds, or something like this. This is something called approximate EFX. Then there is partial, there good partial EFX allocations where we do not allocate all the items, but we allocate something, let's say, very highly valuable items as well as a large number of items. So this is something which is called EFX with charity. There are papers on, on this too. And then there are EFX on special instances like binary instances or two valued instances where every, I mean, valuation of every agent for any good is either one or some number capital N. And there are many other variants. I won't be covering uh, all of them. So, but the main question, the most, the most generic setting, this is, I mean, the question is still open. And the main contribution of our paper is that we show that such allocations are possible when n equals to three, and we will give a constructive proof to this. Okay, so that being said, so let me just briefly sketch of an attempt to what, do, what a constructive proof would look like. So we would maintain a partial EFX allocation. By partial, I mean that not all goods are allocated. And this allocation, I mean, as long as there is some unallocated good, let's say G, I would transform this partial allocation to some other partial EFX allocation. And my goal is that, and my, and my wish is that I never end up at a partial EFX allocation more than once. So if I can guarantee this, then this would show that, well, there, at some point in time, we will hit an EFX allocation. So, uh, so one such, so for instance, that's what's captured by this update rule, basically transforming one partial EFX allocation to the other. So one form of this update rule is the following. So if, if I change a partial EFX allocation X to X prime, then every agent is at least as happy in X prime as they were in X. And one agent, or at least one agent, is strictly better off. In that case, I say that the allocation X prime, Pareto dominates allocation X. So that's what I mean by X prime greater than Pareto dominating, I mean X prime Pareto dominating X. And uh, this is not completely a crazy idea because for the relaxations of EFX that I just mentioned before, such things have actually worked out. So, I mean, our first attempt would be to see, can we actually generalize this for complete EFX? So with that in mind, so let's look at an easy case, which is also very well studied in um, this, uh, I mean, while in, all, in all relaxations of EFX. So for that, I introduced this notion of NV graph. So given an allocation, X1 up to Xn, I define the NV graph as the following. So I have vertices of this graph corresponding to the agents. And there is an edge from agent I to agent J, if I envies J. Okay, so this, this is, this, so I mean, this is the definition of the NV graph. So it's specific to a particular allocation. And now I say that if my partial allocation has an NV graph, which is cyclic, then I can easily come up with another partial EFX allocation where it is not, I mean, where every agent is at least better off. So, I mean, we do the intuitive thing. So as you can see in the NV graph, we have a cycle between agents three, four, six, and five, and we exchange the bundles along the cycle. So as a result of which, you see that every agent along the cycle gets strictly better off and the agents outside the cycle, they retain their previous bundles. And I claim that if the previous allocation, namely allocation X was EFX, the next prime is also EFX. Why? Notice carefully that I haven't changed the bundles. The bundles remain X1 to Xn itself. I have just changed the owners. And I just argued that every agent is at least as happy as he was before. So if an agent didn't envy any other bundle before, he will not envy any other bundle right now because he can only get better off. So this is where it's also crucial what I mentioned before that EFX primarily depends, I mean, an agent I envies an agent J primarily because of the bundle J has. So now this bundle from J has kind of moved to some other person. So this will not, I mean, create any issues for us. Anyway, so this is one, this is somewhat what an update rule would look like. So, so from here on, we would assume that our NV graph would be acyclic because whenever it's cyclic, we have some sort of an update rule with which we can get a Pareto dominating partial EFX allocation. So similarly, I mean, with, uh, I mean, there is the paper 
in SODA, I mean, SODA 20, where, where we showed that if your NV graph has a single source and you have an unallocated good G, then we can also get a partial EFX allocation, which Pareto dominates the existing EFX allocation. And this is also without, I mean, without much significantly breaking up the existing bundles. Let's just say we break up exactly one bundle. So what I mean by that is here, if you see in the previous update rule, we didn't break any bundles. We just moved the bundles. And in this update rule, I say that we just break one bundle. I mean, that's more or less what we do. So, now we come up to more complicated cases. So let's say EX has two sources or EX has three sources. So let's discuss three sources. So in this paper, we show that when your NV graph has three sources, then also such an update rule is possible that we can, if there is an unallocated good, then we can move from one partial EFX allocation to the other, which Pareto dominates it. Here, unfortunately, the update rule is much more complicated and you will have to break up more bundles, not just a single bundle. So I will just sketch the proof here and I'll tell you exactly what is the takeaway because I mean, the entire proof is very technical and beyond the scope of this talk. So as you, so first what I, what I try to do is like I, so let me define some notation at the beginning. So notice that our NV graph has three sources. So none of the agents envy each other. All of the agents are happy with their own bundles. Now I want to allocate a good G. So consider a bundle, let's say, and for an agent I, XI union G. So by XI tilde, I represent the bundle, the subset of XI union G of smallest size, which agent I would still prefer to its old bundle. So this is the smallest subset of XI union G, such that VI of XI tilde is strictly larger than VI of XI. So I would try a very naive first attempt. So let me look at these allocations. That is X1 tilde X2 X3 or X1 X2 tilde X3 or X1 X2 X3 tilde. So one agent gets a, I mean, a strict subset of, I mean, XI union G and the others just retain their old bundles. So if this allocation, if any one of these allocations are EFX, then I'm done, right? Because one agent's valuation strictly improves and the others retain their previous bundles. If it is not, then I claim that the current EFX allocation has some weird structure. Namely, I say that the current EFX allocation is not Pareto optimal. X is not Pareto optimal. Why? I mean, I'll just give you the intuition to why. So like I said before, no agent envies any other agent. So, so let's say one, two, and three, one does not envy two, two does not envy one. And now I take, so now I try to give the good G to one. And I say, I, I ask one to look at the smallest subset of X1 union G that is still envies. And even if I want to give the smallest subset to one, some other agent is not happy. Some other agent will envy this up to any good. So let's say that agent is agent two. So two did not envy one before, but now I'm, I mean, I give him G and I reduce the size of this bundle significantly, even after that two is envying one. And similarly, if I do the same thing with two, let's say, then one would envy, let's say three could envy or one could also envy, but let's say one envies. So this is a very weird situation. And this would suggest that there is some specific subsets in these bundles that I can move around and get a Pareto dominating allocation. So I can get an allocation Y on the same subset of goods that X is defined on, which Pareto dominates X. And what is important in this paper, what we show is this Y is not just any Pareto dominating allocation on X. Y, is a very, y has a very special structure. That is, I mean, with, with the help of this unallocated good G, we can construct an EFX allocation Z from Y. How we construct it is non-trivial, but we can do it. And such that Z is EFX and Z Pareto dominates X. So this is roughly, I mean, the sketch of how when e and the NV graph has three sources also, we can identify another partial EFX allocation, namely allocation Z, which Pareto dominates our previous partial EFX allocation. Okay. So far, so good. So we finally consider the case of two sources. And this somehow turns out to be, I mean, at least we were surprised that, I mean, this is a very strange case because here we cannot, I mean, come up with any update rule. What I mean by that is that I will show you right now in the upcoming slides, a partial EFX allocation X and an unallocated good G. So if you look at the NV graph of X, it has exactly two sources. And what I will show you is that there is no partial EFX and there's no complete EFX allocation 
which Pareto dominates this existing partial EFX allocation. There's some kind of a non-monotonicity, I mean, of this EFX. So if I give you a new good, then some of the agent's valuations will strictly go down. And this is a bit surprising. So what I mean, so let me be a little bit more precise. So we, have, we come up with an instance of three agents and seven goods. We allocate the first six goods, namely this is the allocation, G2, G3, G4 go to agent one, G1 and G5 go to agent two, and G6 goes to agent three. And this is exactly how the NV graph would be looking, and G7 is unallocated. What I claim is now, if you want to allocate G7, at least one of the agent's valuation will strictly go down. Either A1 will be strictly less than 16, or A2 will be strictly less than 15, or A3 will be strictly less than 10 in the final, any final complete EFX allocations. However, I mean, not all hope is lost because we are again observe some things, I mean, special here. So here is one EFX allocation, five, I mean, a complete EFX allocation where agent one and three are strictly better off while agent two is worse off. Here is another complete EFX allocation where one and two are strictly better off, but three is worse off. In particular, what I showed you is that for each I, I have a complete EFX allocation where agent I in particular is better off. Other agents may be worse off, but agent I in particular is better off. And let's say that this is something true in general. Let's say that this not only holds for this instances, but for all instances with two sources. Then can we leverage this fact? Seems that we can. So this is our main contribution. So we come up with this new potential. What is this potential? So we relabel the agents right at the beginning as A, B, and C. And we define this vector, which has the first component as the valuation of agent A, followed by valuation of agent B, followed by valuation of agent C. And what we say is that, so, so first of all, observe that if we obtain any EFX allocation, which Pareto dominates the previous EFX allocation, this vector improves lexicographically. So it's kind of, we can use this as a potential as it is compatible with all of our update rules previously. And let's say that what I said in the previous slide is true. So whenever we are in two sources and we cannot come up with an EFX allocation, Pareto dominating the previous EFX allocation, then I can come up with an EFX allocation where agent A is strictly better off. So agent A is strictly better off. That means that this phi of X prime will still improve. I mean, phi of X prime is still larger than phi of X, even if valuations of B and C go down. So this is our main lemma where we say that a, given any partial EFX allocation and an unallocated good G, there always exists another partial EFX allocation X prime and we can find this constructively such that phi of X prime is lexicographically larger than phi of X. And then this would actually show us convergence. Like, like because this would ensure that we never revisit a partial EFX state again. And this is how we come to our main result where we show that EFX exists for three agents. So to summarize our algorithm is the following. We start with an empty allocation, which is trivially EFX. And as long as there is an unallocated good, we apply this update rule and we obtain an allocation, which is lexicographically better than the previous allocation. So that's more or less all I wanted to say for the purpose of this talk.